Speaking with TJ Walker, dissecting the communication skills and practices of world-class leaders. Welcome to this special edition of Speaking with TJ Walker. Today I've put together a fascinating panel of world-class communicators. It's a little different from most shows. We've got six great guests for you today. We have a New York Times bestseller. We have a prominent stand-up comedian. We have a Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist. We have a prominent, prominent network news analyst, someone you've seen on Fox, HLN, CNN, constantly for the last 20 years. A talk radio host who fills the airways constantly. And we have someone who is a great voice artist. You hear him on the Cartoon Network series, C-Lab. Now, since we don't have six different microphones, I've put this all in one person. I'm very happy to introduce our guest today, Ellis Hennigan. Ellis, thanks for joining us. <laughs> TJ, I've n- I have never been introduced like that, but I like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you are, in fact, all of those things. <laughs> I think that adds up to a short attention span and a man who needs to work. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> but they all involve communication. They're all a little bit different. Many people in our audience are saying, wow, if I could do even one of those things, I would fulfill my dreams. How did you, how did you launch a career that took you in so many different wildly successful paths? And I should say, it wasn't just one f- fluke of a book. You've written nearly a dozen books. A handful of them have become New York Times bestsellers. You've got... I think you've started a couple more books just since we started this interview, <laughs> Making It in America, Worth Dying For, coming out right away, too. So how do you do it all? Well, it, it certainly was not a careful career plan. I will, I will tell you that. I'd love to be able to claim that I was uh, reflecting deeply as a young man and somehow decided that this was where I, I wanted to end up. But I, I guess you and I probably like each other in that way. We have uh, we have found our way through the, the, the twists and turns and realities of the media marketplace and, and, and cobbled these things together. So, I mean, my own story was when I when I got started as a as a young grown up, I worked in the newspaper business and. And that's what I wanted to do. I came from a family of lawyers. I'm the first male in three generations not to be a New Orleans lawyer. And I cast off. And just just curious, you're only a couple of years older than I am. At what age did relatives stop suggesting to you, well, there's still the LSAT prep? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I did. My family did not pressure me in that way. They were actually very good about wanting their kids to to do what they what they thought was. Would be best in the back of my mind as I as I began my career as a journalist. I did always think, well, you know, if this if this newspaper thing doesn't work out, maybe I could I could go to law school. Um, and then I don't know. At some point, it just seemed like that 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 ship had sailed. But but I started a newspaper business, and and I and I loved it. It's great, exciting place to be. And it, it, I started at little papers, and then got onto bigger papers, and and went from being a, a reporter to a to a columnist, and clawed my way to New York. And, and you've been a columnist for for Newsday now for a quarter of a century, a long time, correct? Yeah, yeah, a long time. Um, and I, and that was really, I have to tell you, TJ, the extent of my ambition. I, I mean, it just seemed like, my God, if I could if I could get a job on a on a good newspaper and have a chance to to express my own opinions about stuff going on in the world, I mean, what what could be better than that? And, and truly, I, I you know was almost surprised that that people actually let me do that and, and, and paid me some money to do it. Um, but but as time went on, a couple of things happened. One is that the newspaper business began to decline. And so doing well in the newspaper business in the you know 2000s and beyond really, frankly, just didn't mean what it once did. And newspapers were, were less important in our society. They didn't dominate the the, the media the way they once did. It really wasn't the public conversation the same way. And while, you know, I still love newspapers and, and read a bunch of them every day, um, they, they seem like they were yeah, do, you, do you actually read it in a paper format? Less online? and less, man, less and less. Um, I still like to... To you know, page through ink on paper, but but no, I'm like I'm like most people. And good luck, by the way, finding someone under the age of forty who reads a newspaper 
uh, really in in any way. I mean, it's a, the business is. I, I think it's running out of gas. I mean, I, I I hate to say that, but it it just feels like that's just not the way that that people communicate anymore. Um, there's still great work being done in newspapers, and I, I still got a lot of friends who uh, who've dedicated their lives to it. But 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 I did come to sense that you know what. This is not the format that's going to carry me to my grave. And at the same time, there was all this other media developing. And opportunities would come up. You know, I'd get a call from a, a television producer or someone working on a radio show, often often based on a, a column I'd written, some piece I had in the paper. Hey, would you would you come on and talk about that? And, you know, I came from a big, loud family where we argued at dinner table every night. It wasn't that different from cable news, uh, honestly, <laughs> all those lawyers in the family. Um, uh, you had an advantage. My father was an engineer and was very quiet. <laughs> the dinner time was quiet and serene, which was peaceful, but didn't exactly hone my debate skills. Uh, we, we were the opposite. Everybody was expected to have an opinion about everything. Um but so you know, I started doing that stuff, and and I have to tell you, it reflected poorly on me, TJ, how much I enjoyed it. I remember back in school, I had I had had a teacher who told us that that television was for people with good hair and bad minds, and I guess radio was radio was probably beneath contempt. But at the, at the Columbia Journalism School in the early '80s, they were very print oriented. Let me tell you that. Um, and for our audience who doesn't remember seeing you recently you have a great head of hair i'm, I'm quite <laughs> jealous of your thick shock of white hair uh, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll ride anything i have at this point that's for sure now you brought up the superficial aspect i have to ask you your longest tenure on network tv was at fox that's right yeah i spent I roger spent. ailes famously and i'm going to clean this up for our family oriented audience he famously only hired women who were uh, dateable, we'll say, as on-air analyst and host. The thing that doesn't get much talk about is, and, and he would only hire men as anchors who seemed like you'd want to go out and have a beer with them after, and go to a ball game. What I have noticed, and it's delicate to say this, when he hired liberals, it seemed like the opposite was true. It, 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 he actively went out of his way to hire Non good looking people. You're the exception to that. I mean, I think you and Kirsten Powers were the exception when it came to the non conservatives being sort of non dweeby. So our audience would love to know anything you could share about your, your many years of communicating and being a regular and sometimes being a punching bag at Fox News. Well, the visiting team is how I like to describe it. Um, <laughs> Which I, I believe is where we met in the green room, either right. at CNN yeah, or right. MSNBC or Fox News 20 years ago. No, I, I spent 13 years as a, you know, on, on contract at Fox. And, and I, still, I still appear on their shows and, and have a fairly happy relationship over there. Um, but it was a, you know, the role it was a specific role. And there are challenges, and this is I think this is right in your ballpark, TJ. There are there are special challenges appearing in front of an audience that is not inclined to agree with you. Right? You you get a certain advantage if the audience, even before you open your mouth, wants to wants to cheer what you're likely to say, but 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 it's a different challenge when they're ready not to like you. And I think, you know, I'm a little more liberal politically probably than the average the average Fox viewer. Um, and so it seemed to me that if I was going to succeed in that venue, I had to be likable. Like, for instance, if I just got into a debate with an angry conservative on Fox and we were both yelling at each other, the audience would hear that as the other person was strong and I was being obnoxious. Somehow or another, it seemed to me that I needed to use the tools of, of charm or humor or likability or somehow twist things around so that the audience would, would at least be willing to listen to me. Now, I, you know, I didn't have any illusions. I don't, I don't expect to be saving souls in a five-minute television segment. But, I mean, I would like it if people would at least give a thought to, 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 to what I was trying to say. And it seems to me the cost of entry 
if you're standing in front of or, or being on television in front of an audience that is not inclined to agree with you, is first you got to make them like you, or they're never going to listen to you. And humor is certainly a part of that. Tell us a little more about the difference in how you prepare for a five-minute spot on Fox versus CNN, where people see you frequently, headline news, or MSNBC, where you've appeared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know that the prep is that different. Um, I mean, one of the most crucial things, and, and I would say this to someone who was just sort of thinking about doing stuff in those worlds, you, you've got to understand what the format is. And, and each of these... Uh, places is different. You know, it's different what someone needs to do to, to as you know, to, to prepare a half hour, keep no address versus what you're going to be able to do if, if you're, you know, arguing with a skinny blonde woman for five minutes. Um, they're just, you need different stuff. And on, on, t- on a television appearance, uh, the mistake is to go on and try and sound like Mr. Smarty Pants. It's not a format that works well with citing lots of statistics and making very complex arguments. It, the, you know, the audience is not paying that much attention. The speed is too quick. There's a lot of going on. So you really, in a, in a short TV segment, have the chance to make one or two or, God, at most three relatively straightforward points. Um, so so what I try to do before I go in those things, I mean, I, I need to make sure that I know the basic facts of the story of the issue that we're discussing. But, you know, I, I keep up with that stuff all day long. I mean, that's pretty much all I do. So I don't necessarily have to go do a, you know, an, an explicit research project if I'm going to be debating Donald Trump this week. Um, but I try to have in my, my head you know, two or three things that I want to say. And maybe even if, I, if I'm lucky, a, a humorous or a kind of clever way to say it, or some, something that feels fresh to me, that it feels like something I just haven't heard a hundred times already. So they're getting something special out of me. And so I have that in the back of my head. And, you know, sometimes I get to use it and sometimes I don't. It dep- I'm not running the conversation always. And so I, I don't like to be one of those persons who just goes on and gives a speech. It seems to me those segments are better if you interact and debate and discuss and, and kind of kind of dance around a little bit. Um, and so... Alex, you mentioned Donald Trump debating him. You've been... A- on Fox News Channel hundreds if not thousands of times. How do you win a debate if you are opposing someone you feel very strongly just lies, just makes up stuff? How do you win a debate well, like that? Well, gosh, I mean, there's a lot of techniques, and, and, and you don't always. I mean, you know, sometimes, I mean, and Trump's a great example of that. I mean, he has his own odd, effective ways of, of kind of bullying his way through those things. I, I mean, it seems to me there are a couple of things you got to always do. One is avoid getting mad. Once you get mad or lose your cool, you've lost. And, and particularly in, in front of an audience that's you know not already agreeing with you. Um, I think you've got to find a way to make your points. Don't don't just try to answer them or correct them or you know you've got to figure out what it is you want to say, how you want to frame the issue, what you think the strongest argument is. And articulate that in a, in a way that's compelling. And I think that the, the trap in that kind of particular that kind of confrontational plot of what cable news is today, right? I mean, you know, they they believe they get energy and, and, and keep the interest up by having people who disagree with each other. I mean, what's that joke? The worst two words in television, or good point. <laughs> Good point. The conversation is over, right? Or I agree. Right? It's like no, 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 no. That doesn't really. That's not really what we're looking for. Um, but but yet, I mean, I think you you got to understand what you want to say. Keep your cool. Make your points, and you know you can you can give a little dig at the other person, or you can you can be a little you know dismissive if, or, or contradictory of something they're saying when they say something that's just out and flat out wrong or a lie. I mean, you don't necessarily want to just let it pass without comment. But I, but I will tell you that if you end up in a in a shouting match of, yes, it is, no, it's not, yes, it is, no, it's not, it's just not a very effective way to communicate in that setup. And you mentioned you like to use humor. Certainly, all the times I've seen you, I have a very strong image of you having a smile on your face. Now, you've taken it a step further. Unlike a lot of people who are afraid to venture out into areas where they might make a fool of themselves or might fall flat on their face, 
you have gone on to the stand-up comedy stage. I've seen you before, and uh, Jerry Seinfeld is nervous, but I have to say, you've, you've put on a good show. <laughs> Let me tell you. And uh, how, did you, how did you even get the nerve... Uh, past the age of 21 <laughs> to take up stand-up comedy. Well, you I, I do think of that as really, at some levels, the hardest you, form of public speaking. Absolutely because right. Absolutely. It is the so, expectations are uh, so much higher. So much, you know, absolute hardest thing. You're, to, you're totally right about it. Much harder than, than one-on-one with O'Reilly or whatever you think, that, whatever you think the toughest thing is in the, in the news biz. Be, be, for a couple of reasons, right? Um, one is the audience is drinking. Right, they're not they're and they're they're not shy about saying you suck. You know they will tell you if 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 they don't like you. Also, I mean the the, the kind of the business of comedy today. You know, think about who's in the audience at a comedy club. You know, mostly it's you know young drunk adults on a date. I mean, and tourists. I guess that's really pretty much the audience. And so you know they're not necessarily looking for the most erudite humor. I mean, you know, but fart fart joke might go over better than a than a Nancy Pelosi joke. Um, Who? <laughs> <laughs> that can be the response. Yeah. But I want one one. I'll tell you one lesson I've learned. And, and, and again, this is this I think is 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 up your alley. Like if. If you're doing stand-up comedy and you're halfway funny, people think you're terrible. If you are giving – if you're the luncheon speaker and you're halfway funny, people think you're hilarious. I think the expectations are different. The bar is different. Um, The audience is listening in a different way. Um, boy, I, the expectations are much yeah, lower. Exactly. In most speeches at conventions, conferences, business meetings, people expect you to deliver a horrible, awful, boring right. data dump. Right. So if you get one laugh, you are by far the best speaker they've seen all day, perhaps all week. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stand-up comedy, if I don't get a laugh every 10 seconds, I'm angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're 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 absolutely right. I, I will say this: I found it, and I don't I don't think of myself really as a, as a professional stand-up. I mean, I've I've bounced around in it. I really haven't done it lately, and I I need to get back to do it. But it has ta- it taught me a lot. It taught me how to listen. Um, a big part of stand-up, as you know, is interactive. So it, you you can't just even if you have your set beautifully memorized, you're not a good stand-up if you just get up and deliver it like a robot. I mean, you've got to interact with the people there. So it teaches thinking on your feet. It teaches dealing with, you know, tough audiences. It teaches kind of bobbing and weaving and rolling with it. Um, and those are all skills that are certainly useful in a, in a TV pundit role or talk radio or, or, or even, a, even a stand up in front of a room and give a speech role. You're listening to Speaking with T.J. Walker. Our special guest is Alice Hennigan, the wildly pro- prolific multimedia communications guy. You've seen him on Fox News for years. Now you see him on CNN. You may have read any one of his dozen books, including several New York Times bestsellers. His latest books, Making It in America and Worth Dying For. Now, Ellis, your background was as a writer first, and, and you have solid journalistic credentials. You're a graduate of the School of Journalism at Columbia University, which most people think is the preeminent journalism school in America, if not the world. You worked in newspapers for years. You've got a longer track record at a major newspaper than anyone else I can think of. You've won a Pulitzer for some of your reporting at Newsday. And then you branched into writing books, and you didn't just say, let me write one or two You've put together a very significant body of work, and they're all different, whether they're about Daryl Waltrip and sports stars or prominent soldiers who've come back from major wars, but they do all combine uh, strong storytelling elements. How did you get into the whole book writing, and how is that different from writing a column? It's, it's, it's a lot different, um, other than being longer, right? They run a lot longer than a column does. Um, Again, it was not a not a great plan, but but I'll tell you what happened. Um, when my hometown football team, the New Orleans Saints, won the Super Bowl, I guess half a dozen years ago now, um, I had a friend who was connected to the team, and, 
and hooked me up with the coach, who's a guy named Sean Payton. Um, and he was uh, thought he might want to write a book just as they were about to win the Super Bowl. So uh, he and I had a little visit, and I told him I'm come from New Orleans, and you know I didn't know that much about football, but he didn't know that much about New Orleans, so it seemed like we might be a good team. And so I wrote that book with him, and uh, the book did well. And you know it was a story. It wasn't really a football book. I mean, it was a story about a a beleaguered team and a, a beleaguered city, you know, New Orleans after Katrina, sort of inspiring each other to greatness. And, and it was a, it was fun. I liked doing it. I liked him. Uh, the book did well. Penguin published it and sold a bunch of copies of it. And so that just, you know, opened up opportunities. P- people, pe- people only think in that you can do what you have already done, right? I, I wasn't a better writer. No, you, you've shown did. that's wrong throughout no, I mean, your but career. That's, but that's right. I mean, people want you to when you do something once and it works. They want you to, they want you to to, to do it again. But but it's different from it's very different from anything else I do for, for for a couple of reasons. One is that every one of those book projects has been me teamed up with someone else, right? Someone who has been amazing, has lived some you know wild and fascinating and crazy life, and and is is often someone that the public's interested in. It's some, they're mostly not obscure people. They're people who are well known to some extent. And so, really, what I'm I'm in a storyteller role there. This is not like me or you going on television and just spouting off our opinions about something going on in the world. This really is me working with someone and crafting a story. It's not really about what I think about one of these topics. This is me helping someone. You know, pull that story out and tell it in a way that's compelling, and and so it's a it's a much more of a I don't know an interactive process. It's a cooperative thing. It's a, and it's not as much about my ego, really. I mean, you know, I, I don't always necessarily you know even agree with every single attitude or view that's that, that that's expressed. But that's not my role. My role there is to be a, an effective and, and and compelling storyteller. And to make people interesting. Now, I haven't read all of your books. I have read every word. I'm not of your... sure I've read all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I I have read every word of your book on Dwight Gooden, for example, okay. even though I'm not a baseball fan. And fascinating stories. How long does it take you to work with someone, interview, just get in their world before you can pull a great book out of them? Yeah, it's. I mean, it's a little different from from case to case. But I, you know, I'm doing. I'm doing more than one a year. I mean, maybe not, maybe it's close to two a year. So I guess I'm working maybe on average about six months. Um, and it's about, you know, I just, we just sit down and talk. You know, I run tape. We, uh, I, I, you know, I have some notion at the beginning of what the story is. You know, in Dwight, it was just, you know, baseball guy with baseball pitcher, maybe the greatest pitcher of his generation, um, completely unprepared for the fame success that he had and he throws it away in drug addiction and, and, and other life issues and so it's kind of a you know moving and tragic story and it had never really been told right I mean Dwight had never really fully opened up about it and, and you know he was willing to do that and you know he came over and sat on my couch and we talked a lot and then we wrote it and you know worked back traded forth and you know he would you know t- it would one chat that would spark another idea, and you know, in the end, I think we we had a, a pretty, you know, I mean, a shockingly open. I mean, my God, the guy opened up about everything. He revealed all. I mean, oh, all man. the drug he didn't, he didn't use, much, the abuse. He didn't leave much on the table. Yeah. He definitely didn't whitewash himself and uh, try to make himself look perfect or like a saint. It's the opposite. Now, some of our audience members are thinking, "Wow, it sounds like this guy. This guy has the secret formula." to writing successful books in New York Times sellers. I think I'll call him and have him co-write my book. It's not that simple, is it? I mean, someone in our modern culture really has to have a degree of fame in order to move books, don't they? Well, as you know, when you talk to people in the book industry, the word they use more than any other is platform. What's the platform here? How are we going to how are we going to get people to know about this book? Right? There's a millions of books come out every year. And some of them, some of them are good, but readers have to know that they're there. Somehow or another, you've got to get it onto the shelf in the bookstore or prominently on on, on Amazon. But 
But even more than that, the audience needs to know to want it, right? They've got to have some kind of way to, 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 to actually kind of realize it's there to buy it. And so, so what has become increasingly important is the ability to get on television, the ability to, you know, create PR and, you know, find some kind of way that you get public attention for your book that makes stand out among the, Many, many other books that, that someone might buy. And, you know, you're asking someone to do a fair amount. I mean, a book, a hardcover book is, you know, it lists for 25 or $26. And, you know, you probably pay 18 or 19 for it. So, you know, you're, you're asking a, a, the, the reader to, to make, a, make a pretty good sized commitment there. And it's not an insignificant financial commitment. It's not just a little Kindle book for 99 cents. You're, you're doing so called real books with. Major publishers with real paper, hardback. Yeah, although and although I don't turn up my nose at the other thing. I mean, I think we're probably all heading in that direction, aren't we? I, you know, my attitude, honestly, TJ. I mean, I've seen a lot of this technology change, and I don't. I mean, I'm not really for for one or another. I just, you know, I love the idea that people are reading and people are listening, and you know, they're all every one of these formats, every one of these platforms has good and bad things about it. The fact that someone's listening. Listening to, to, to you and me talk right now, right? There's a you can get inside someone's head in a way when you listen to their voice in a way that's difficult on paper. So this has advantages, but then there are other things that are great. A book, you know, you can get into such depth and nuance, and you have so much room that you know you can never do a podcast of that length. Um, so I just to me that each one is interesting, and I just I just want to I just want to be involved in all of them if I can. You mentioned that you can get in people's heads with podcasts, certainly radio. You and I have spoken before, and I think you've told me that, that radio is really the medium you enjoy the it's most. Fun. Tell us about your, your involvement, because you've had numerous shows over the year. You're a frequent guest host at the premier talk station in America, WABC. You've, you've co-hosted, guest hosted on every major network. You've substituted for Alan Combs. Tell us about your your love affair with talk radio, but also what you see as the limitations of it. Well, it's fun. I, I mean, that's the first piece of it, right? There's so little. It's 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 like me and you talking today. There's there's very little between us and the audience, right? There's not a hundred producers. There's not a bunch of screaming graphics. It's just really, you know, a human being, one person talking into the ear of another person, and so there is a. There is a purity and a humanity and a simplicity to it that is just really, to me, exciting. If you're if you're good on the radio, it's because of you. If you're terrible on the radio, it's because of you. And so, there are very few other instances in the media where one individual really, really is driving the train in quite in quite in the same way. Um, as a business, it sucks. I mean, it's uh, it has so many limitations. I mean, people like to look at pictures. I think is 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 one of its limitations. The the AM radio dial, which is where most of the talk is, is is as a technology, you know, vastly surpassed by 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 many other ways to communicate. The audience is ancient. I mean, the average the average radio listener is really old today, particularly in AM. Um, the, as an advertising vehicle, I just it's not as it's not as potent as it once was. I mean, so so all of this. Also, it's it's been captured by the sort of most extreme and intolerant parts of the right wing in America, which isn't to say there aren't good radio shows out there, including some good conservative shows. But it's you know it's a who are your favorites? Certainly, Rush Limbaugh has been the gold standard of talk radio since 1988. But who? Who do you think is just the best broadcaster, even if you think they're full of baloney? And who do you respect the most in talk radio as a as a, da- a prominent daily talk show host? Well, I mean, yes, Rush is Rush does as good a show as as anyone, and in, in many ways invented the format that others that others follow. And so, yeah, you can't you can't talk about that business without you know. Even even if you disagree with all kind of stuff, his his outlook he, as as a performer, the guy is uh, the guy is the gold standard. Um, I like people who have humor and humanity. You mentioned Alan Combs; I think he does a he does a terrific show. John Gibson, who does a conservative show on Fox, that's a you know much smaller show. I think does a great show. I think he's, he's a born talk radio performer. 
I wish more people haven't hear heard him. his haven't heard his show. Certainly remember him f- as a host on air host at Fox TV mm-hmm. and in fact, MSNBC. He used to be there. Yep. He used to be on a show with him all the time. Yep. But haven't heard his radio good, show. Good good guy does a really interesting show. Like I say, it's I mean it's it's you know part of the Fox lineup on the radio. I, it's it's I mean I, I, you, you got to go looking for it. But it's a it's a a terrific show. I mean listen, you, I mean I have to you have to admire what the the vast amount of good stuff that NPR does every single day of the week. I mean, there are people over there, just the size of it, and the scope of it is just so, so giant. Um, I think Stephanie Miller is someone kind of among the left hosts that I think has humor and isn't preachy. I, mean, I don't like being yelled at. I mean, I don't want somebody who's just, you know, hammering and banging me over the head. I, to me, if I'm going to listen to somebody, particularly for three hours, um, no, I want some. I want some intelligent banter, and I want to learn some things, and I want to have some fun. And so the hosts, whether you know, left, right, dumb, brainy, um, you know, to me, that's what's that's what's interesting. That's what that's what would make me want to, you know, turn off the music station and turn on the talk station. If you want to hear more from Ellis on a regular basis, I'd urge you go to his website, Hennigan.com. We'll link to that in the show notes. That's three W's dot H-E-N-I-C-A-N dot com. You can also say hello to him and thank him for being on this show on Twitter. It's at Hennigan. Again, that symbol H-E-N-I-C-A-N, and you can reach out to him there. You can also find out about his upcoming appearances, he often mentions when he'll be on Headline News or WABC or his stand-up or when his latest book is coming out. So that's a great way to stay in touch with one of the premier master communicators in the world, in my view. You're listening to Speaking with T.J. Walker, the show that's all about world-class leaders and analyzing how they communicate, what they do, what they do that's different, how they prepare and how they get their message out. If you haven't yet subscribed to this show, please do so. If you have subscribed, then please leave a review for the show and tell others as well. Ellis, you mentioned O'Reilly a moment ago. He's been number one on the ratings heap for a long time on cable TV. He's certainly not the only conservative. He's not the most conservative, what does he do well that perhaps casual viewers might not detect? How has he been able to do this for so long? Boy, that's a great question, I, and I've got I, I've got lots of thoughts about that. One is he knows his audience. He has a very good sense about what the people who watch his show and the people who might watch his show, what they're interested in. And, you know, some of it is a political outlook. Some of it is just more of what I would call an attitude, a kind of – just a kind of way of looking at the world, a tone. And I think he has a very good sense of that. One, another is that he is, he's not down the line, predictable, 100% conservative. He, he's like an 85%. Yeah, I would, I would have said 90, but 85 is a pretty good guess, right? Once in a while, I'll surprise you. And to me, that makes him far more interesting than his competitors who absolutely day in and day out, you can utterly predict what they're going to say on any single issue. It just, it just cough, cough, Sean Hannity. It, <laughs> cough, it, cough. Just, it just inserts, it inserts a little interest in it. You know, you wonder, and it's fun once in a while when the guy says something, you know, that you expect. And, and I want to hear him, I want to hear him explain and argue. The other thing about O'Reilly, and this is something, frankly, I think I've benefited from with him over the years. I don't know how many times I've done his show, but a lot. Um, Bill is willing to have a guest on and even a one-on-one exchange with someone who is a strong guest who he disagrees with. You will notice how rare that is in the cable television world. Either they'll just have some idiot on uh, articulating a position they disagree with, or they'll set it up in a way that the person really can't get much in. They'll have six other guests, or they'll... They'll find some way to frame the issue in a way that makes it very difficult. But O'Reilly really has the self-confidence, and maybe that's part of what he's got. Because he's not, you know, particularly good-looking. He's not particularly charming. Although, you know, maybe and he's not funny the way Rush was at least no, at one point. No, the sh- and the show is is produced in a very straightforward. I mean, I think it's professionally produced, 
but there is something just very compelling about it. And, and I, I, I give him credit that that opening, the talking points at the beginning of the show is one of the best monologues in, in news television. And he's again, you know, he will go and I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of doing it quite a number of times, you know, just literally in his face back and forth arguing passionately some point with someone he disagrees with and someone, I mean, I don't mean to say this in a self-flattering way, but I mean someone who, who's capable of conducting an argument. And it's been some of, the, some of my best experiences on television. I mean, I, when I come off, I might get 200, you know, hostile emails from some of his, some of his audience, but I don't, I don't care about that. Why is it so hard for other networks to come up with something similar? Our audience is very familiar with Roger Ailes and who's recently left. But I do consider him a true mastermind and media genius. Part of it, and it doesn't get talked about as much, is just he picks a host, he gives them time to build an audience, and he stands by them. Bill O'Reilly, again, I'm not, a, in fairness, a fan of Bill O'Reilly, but my understanding is that when he started the first couple of years, the ratings were awful. And it was several years before it gained any traction, and I guess maybe five years before it became number one. Bill O'Reilly's had his own, <clears throat> shall we say, legal <laughs> employment problems, and Ailes stuck with him. At MSNBC, it seems like if a host looks the wrong way or loses two viewers, they're fired. I mean, the, the never-ending parade of new formats, new hosts... Uh, the revolving door there, it's, it, it just seems like the audience can't build a relationship with them. And to me, that's part of the beauty of Fox is if you like the morning show, it's the same people 20 years later. If you like Sean Hannity in you know, 8, 9 o'clock hour for 20 years, you get him. What would you do if you were all of a sudden given MSNBC and you had to Come up with a true competitor at a news level and a political ideological level to Fox. Boy, I, I got to tell you, I know, I'm not sure I have any great insight on that. I, I think it's t running a television network is really hard. And I mean, you just made a good case, I think, for the idea of coming up with a lineup and sticking with it for a long time. But, you know, there are instances where people stick with stuff too long. It's just it's terrible. You, know, you just got to get rid of it. So I don't. I don't know. I, I mean, I think I, you, you, you got to say Ailes, from a, as a broadcasting executive, uh, has accomplished something tremendous. Um, but you know, there's there's a lot of other good shows, and I don't I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. Should should MSNBC be more ideological? Should it be more? Or should it be less ideological? Should it be more entertainment driven? I, I don't know. I, it's I seriously. I wish I had some great answer to that. I do recognize, knowing some of the people whose job it is to try and make those decisions, it, you might think it's easy. It ain't easy. Oh, I don't think it's easy. <laughs> it's, I mean, seriously, it's very hard. I, you know, and you, you'll do something and your ratings will fall and your advertisers will start abandoning you. And you're, I mean, it's, it's really, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm barely able to get through a segment. I don't know if I could run a network. Now, speaking of hard, it's pretty hard for people to see any individual with more than one hat. I know that in my own career, people see me as the media trainer quite often. They don't want to hire me as a public speaker because they think, oh, that guy is a trainer. Mm -hmm. You have a reputation as a newspaper columnist, a serious journalist, and yet somehow you've been a hit out in Hollywood for years now <laughs> with a cartoon network. You are the voice of Stormy. In C Lab, how did that all come about? <laughs> it almost didn't actually. Um, you know, it's funny I, when when that gig came up, up, and I had there were two TV producers that I worked on a show on the USA Network with Matt Thompson and Adam Reed. Are the names young, just kind of smart ass kids, overgrown college kids, basically, uh, who got that gig at the Cartoon Network to make that to make that show, and we'd worked together. And they had all the other voices were. You know, serious voice actors and, and well-known people. Eric Estrada, do you remember him? An actor from the TV show Chips, and there's another guy. Oh yes, yeah, sure. Does, who's a Broadway vet? And, but they had this one character, this kind of um, good-looking nitwit, basically named Stormy. <laughs> my, when my sister heard that, she said, "Ah, oh, yes, typecasting." Um, <laughs> 
But he was, you know, well bred and nice looking. But anytime anything bad happened, pretty much Stormy did it. Um, and and when we when we began discussing it, I mean, I had a conversation with my agent about it. You'll, you'll appreciate this, having worked in that world a little bit. He he was like, listen, I don't know. If we're trying to make you out to be a serious television pundit and a and a you know respectable journalist. Do we really want you to be a cartoon voice? And I was like, yeah, I don't know. It'll be fun. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. I got to tell you, DJ, I have not had a meeting about some career issue with a serious editor or broadcasting executive that one of the first things they don't ask me is, tell me about Stormy. How'd you get that gig? That's so cool. <laughs> I think it's the, it's the one thing they, they don't want to hear about the thousands of newspaper columns I've written. They want to know about cartoon voicing. Um, this is fun. I mean, I don't, you know, it's not something I've, you know, devoted my career to or taking that seriously. But I'll tell you this, it opened me up to some audiences that don't watch uh, cable news. You know, I'll get these, I'll get these emails. <laughs> you talk about O'Reilly. I get these emails that'll be like, I'm a sophomore from a, a large Midwestern university. I feel like it's a letter to Penthouse or something. I'm a sophomore from a Midwestern university and holy crap, he said Stormy's on O'Reilly and it sounds just like him. <laughs> They don't know. They can just to tell. They can tell from the voice, the voice because you're not yeah. changing your your voice not, that much. Not that not that much. Or some. I mean, some of the real fans know know who the voice actors are and, and follow that stuff. And oh my God, they know the plot and the twists in that show. People will ask me these obscure questions about character development and some plot. I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. Now, are you are you like Jerry Springer in that you don't even watch the show, or no, you do I watch it's the great. show? No, it's great. It's in, okay. fact, in fact, those guys, C Lab is now has now has now wrapped. Um, we got we got six seasons and DVDs and all that. But those guys are now doing a show that is doing very well, and I think it's paying them a lot more money than C Lab did. Called Archer, that's on the FX network, and is a is a you know very popular, but I would say higher class. Animated show than uh, than Sea Lab was. Well, the Sea Lab is hilarious. I got to tell you. And uh, walk us through this process because you go live on O'Reilly or taped to live. You say it once. That's it. For a network cartoon series, I'm imagining you in this little booth and redoing each line 27 different ways. But tell us about the process of recording that. Sure. sure. You know, the first show, the very first time we did it, they got us all together in a large studio in New York over on the west side of Manhattan. And all the voice actors were there. And about I guess about half a dozen of us. And we all had our little easels and our scripts. And it was a disaster. And everyone was stepping in everyone's lines, and no one would be quiet long enough. And we had to, we had to wait for Eric Estrada to call everybody baby. I mean, it was just a mess. <laughs> um, and so after that, we did it differently. We would go into you're right, a little tiny little booth in a studio on 45th Street, Manhattan, called Sound Hound. And it was an amazing microphone and audio system. I mean, you could literally hear your heartbeat in that booth. And it was maybe, I would say, twice the size or three times the size of a phone booth, but not large. And I, my guy would have whatever lines he had in that episode. And, you know, some episodes, he was in every episode, and he had a lot of lines in some episodes and, and, and not as many in others. And I would do each of those lines until they liked it. And so if the line was, oh, my God, we're going to hit an iceberg. I would say it the way I thought it should be said, and then they would say, "Can you say that a little slower, or can you have a little laugh in the middle of it?" Or, "Oh my God, <laughs> we're gonna hit an iceberg." So, you know, I would do it multiple. You're right. Sometimes the first time they'd be happy, and sometimes I had to do it ten times. Um, but they were sometimes in New York, although they lived in Atlanta, so sometimes literally they were on a phone line, but they were in my headphones. I don't know how they do that, but somehow. So you're getting direction do. from yes. the producers or the directors from other cities. Absolutely, and they then I, I take all that voice audio content, which gets sent to them as a I don't know somehow electronically. You would know more about the mechanics of it than I do, and then they stitch it together on a Mac and put it on top of the the pictures, which I never saw. I never see the animation as I'm doing the voice, so. I just I have a script that's just like a regular you know TV script or a movie script and you know I would take a little yellow highlighter and, and highlight Stormy's lines so I would just and we would just go through them in order like that. 
And would you do a whole season's worth no. in three 12 hour days or how no, did it just, work? We did them one episode at a time. And I think they were writing them one episode at a time. So when they would have another one written and they were happy with it, they would get us all together and we would, you know, sometimes I would run into the other, to the other actors. A couple of them were in LA, so I never really saw them, but um, you know, they would, they would just make appointments and, you know, for several hours of each of us coming in. But um, no, we just, we just did one episode at a time. And when you're at a cocktail party in you know the, the chic trendy Soho oh, part well, of that's town, that's been all my life. Yeah. Exactly. What impresses people the most? Is it a Pulitzer Prize? Is it being on network TV? Is it Stormy? <laughs> is it all the books? What is it? I mean, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know that any of it does. I, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> you know, I mean, listen, I just feel it is hard to impress that crowd. I just, I just feel like I'm lucky to be working. You know, I mean. I, Lucky I'm to be working. I mean, I'm, you're listen. You're the same way. You're around a lot of people who are, you know, richer and more famous, and and you know, have probably easier lives. And I don't know. I mean, I, I consider myself very blessed, right? I get to do things that I enjoy. I get to insert myself into all these interesting worlds that are outside of my own experience. Um, and I can, you know, most of the time make a living at it. Once in a while, I'll make a great living. I mean, once in a while, I'll feel like I'm being vastly overpaid, but that nothing doesn't happen wrong to me. With, nothing wrong with that. No, I, I, I aspire to it every single day. Um, but, you know, I mean, on balance, TJ, I, I feel like I have more fun and better morale and a cooler life than, you know, all my relatives who are lawyers. Um, there you go. <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, you know what? In some ways, you know, when they get into their, you know, later years, they probably have, you know, I'm still out hard hustling around and they're probably, you know, hitting senior status in a law firm somewhere. So I don't know who gets the last laugh. You tell me. But the hustle keeps you thin and lean and looking for new opportunities <laughs> and learning too. Yeah. Our audience is learning a lot today with Ellis Hennigan. You can learn about him on a regular basis by going to Hennigan.com. It's linked to in the show notes. You can also follow him on Twitter at Hennigan. You can read any one of his, seems like dozens of books, but we're right about a dozen books. Let's talk about your your latest book. What is it about, and how did you get involved with this project? Well, the, la- the last thing that's in the stores now is called Making It in America. It came out uh, a couple of months ago, I guess. Um, and and I, I teamed up with a guy named John Bassett III. And John Bassett, people may recognize that name. He is a titan of the American furniture industry. Bassett Furniture and his, and his company, which is now Vaughn Bassett Furniture, they make, they make bedroom sets, wood, wood bed furniture. And around third generation, a guy in that company, which was, which was at one point the largest manufacturer in America of, of that kind of stuff. Um, around 2000, 2002, in those years, TJ, the furniture industry went through something that, that, that a lot of American industries, manufacturers, sadly have, which is that uh, they began closing their factories down, their American factories, and mostly in places like North Carolina, Virginia, and moving to low-wage, cheaper places like mostly China, but China and then Vietnam and India and Indonesia and some, some other places in that part of the world where the Factories could crank out furniture a whole lot cheaper than the Americans were. And literally, it decimated the furniture manufacturing business. Now, you know, the retailers were still here. The designers were still here. The PR people were still here. But the actual furniture, even from great names in American furniture, virtually all of it made overseas. And John Bassett, who was this, as I say, a third-generation Virginia furniture guy, said, I'm not closing my factory. He said, these people working in this factory in Galax, Virginia, he said, they turned my family into multimillionaires, and I'm not going to turn my back on them. And so he said, we're going to figure out how to beat this thing. And so instead of, instead of throwing out all these, uh, these you know, hard-working mountain people, throwing them out of work, he sat down and started talking to them. So what are we going to do? To do? How are we going to compete with the Chinese? What are we going to do that's going to make us better, that's going to keep this company going, that's going to keep your jobs, and frankly, going to, going to keep me in business? And it's one of the great stories in, in, in American business. And he has, uh, he has succeeded. He's been at it now for uh, you know almost 15 years since all the others left. He led his industry in an anti-dumping suit 
against China, who was engaged in all kind of illegal trade practices. And they won the suit and got big, big money damages. And uh, he's really, really a hero. So the book Making It in America, it's really the story of, of how he did that. Now his, his life story is really, is on the people may see soon, is uh, on the road to being an HBO miniseries. Tom Hanks' uh, production company, Playtone, has bought it and is turning it into a to uh, his life story into a oh boy Tom Hanks is involved oh, he'd be a I, great, I'm starting to smell success he'd be a great John Bassett too I'll tell you saving the town and standing up to the to the evil Chinese competitors and so and I'm, I'm curious how how do you do that because I like the idea of nice American made furniture right? and works from you know I grew up in North Carolina so you I know. Like the idea of them getting paid on the other hand my wife is Chinese, and she wants the best bargain. She wants to go to Ikea and get that stuff that looks great mm -hmm. but was manufactured in China, and I can get it really inexpensively, so there's more money left for our daughter and our home. How did he do <laughs> well, it? Well, that's the challenge. I mean, he, he says we, one thing is that American business just gave up too quickly. He says, in fact, we have a lot of advantages. One thing is that there's not an ocean between us and our, and our clients, our customers. So we, so we can be more nimble. We can make the furniture more quickly. We can get it into people's hands fast. And you know what? American workers are pretty good if you get them motivated and focused. And they'll figure out ways to do things at a, at a lower price. And we get the right machinery in there. Maybe we really can outcompete those people. And I think the lesson that, that, that we learned from Vaughn Bassett Furniture is that, no, it's not easy. And, yeah, they may have some advantages. But Americans still have a lot of things on their side in that stuff. And plus, you know what? When you buy something made in this country, it has huge benefits to us. That dollar spent echoes around some town. It employs somebody. It pays the diner waitress and keeps the school teacher working. And, and that money gets spent and comes back around and helps us all. And, you know, I don't know if we want to be a nation that doesn't make anything. And I, cer I certainly like inspiring stories of people who figure out a way to survive. So it sounds like that's a great example of factory workers who found a way to survive. But I'm interested in your strategies for young people who want to survive in the field of journalism and media. And at some point in your career, you went from thinking of yourself as a newspaper guy to a guy who tells stories in any media wherever. Most people don't have that asset. Since I've known you, you're... The first thing out of your mouth is usually yes when someone asks, not, well, tell me how many downloads you have in your podcast, TJ, before I consent to being interviewed. <laughs> your attitude is yes, but I want to know what advice do you have? If you had a 21-year-old niece or nephew come to you and say, wow, she sounds like you have just a fascinating career. I want to be you, <laughs> or I want to at least want to have a career in the media and as a communicator and with some, some branch of journalism. What would your advice be to that person? Oh, boy, you, you put your finger on, on, on a good start, which is to be open to stuff and, and easy and fun to work with and have people want to be around you and feel like you're offering something. Now, this is a business, as you know, that's filled with unhappy, complaining people. And if you're, you know, the first one raising your hand, that's definitely a really good really good place to start. I, I mean, I, I have a few other thoughts. One is that, is that writing is still very important, even for people who don't think of themselves as, you know, the, the, the young woman who wants to be a TV anchor or, or, you know, it's still the ability to, to communicate with written words is still where so much of it starts. I, I know anytime you start an interview, you take little notes or you come up with an idea or you have to present it. It really is where... Not only the communicating starts, but, but often where the thinking starts. You know, I don't often know what opinion I have about something until I, until I try to write something down. So, I mean, I would, I would certainly focus early on writing. Another is don't be a snob. You know, don't think you have to only work for the New York Times or, or you know, CBS News or MSNBC. You know, the, the, the way you get going in this is to get going. And that's how you that's how you get better. That's how you make the relationships that will that will help you down the road. Those people working with you on that little website today, you know, in five years are going to be in big hiring positions in other places. So creating those relationships is is, is also hugely important. 
And, and what medium are you most excited about these days? Certainly, pop stars like Justin Bieber have have come and sprung out of places like YouTube. There are Twitter stars, Instagram stars, podcasting. It seems to be exploding right now with everyone from Hillary Clinton to former speechwriters for Obama starting podcast. And a lot of these media are, are very inexpensive. Of course, there's good old-fashioned blogging if you want to build your your writing skills. What do you think a young person, let's say it's someone in their junior year of college, and they've got free time and they've got internship time, where would you recommend they spend their time between you know, working for their school newspaper versus like one of your colleagues at CNN, Brian Seltzer, just started his own blog and just became a complete news hound for the television industry. And that attracted such an audience in that niche. He's got his own show on CNN. That's right. I mean, he was a student at Towson State, I think, in Maryland, just in, who knew really didn't know anything about TV. He just started doing it. You've got to give him credit. Um, I, first of all, I, I resist the notion that there's some secret bullet in this platform or that platform. And I mean, I wouldn't say, well, forget YouTube, but go to Twitter. I, I don't think that's easy. So the answer is to be open to all of those things. But, but, but if I had more general advice, I think I would say do stuff that puts you in contact with others, particularly others who are better than you are. Um, the, sitting in your room and writing by yourself is, you know, needs to be part of it. But boy, that can be discouraging. And, and I think, you know, doing the internship, volunteering on the website, having someone who's editing you, having someone who's reading whatever it is you're writing or, or, or presenting or editing or talking and, and setting standards for you and making you redo it and getting better at it. And I, to me, that really is the root. Find people who are doing what you want to be doing. And make yourself indispensable for them. And early in the game, you're going to have to do it for cheap or little or maybe even free. Um, but it's though these are still, despite all this technology, TJ, these are still businesses of relationships. People like working with people they know and like. And you want to make yourself one of those people. You want to make yourself the one who's happy to do it, who can turn it around fast, who doesn't create a lot of, uh, you know, any real pain in the butt. Um, and I, uh, yeah, these are still, it's funny. We think of these as solitary industries, all this telecommuting and all that, but those, those personal relationships are, I think, what drive the careers. Alice Hennigan, sage advice, do things that put you in contact and working with other people, which is why I'm happy to be talking and in a sense, working with Ellis Hennigan today. The website is Hennigan.com. His books are too numerous to list, but we're going to list them in the show notes. I'm T.J. Walker. Ellis, thanks for being our guest today. T.J., this is great. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. Thanks for listening to Speaking with T.J. Walker, where the communication skills and practices of world-class leaders are dissected. 